Jared, and welcome everyone to our service this morning. Special thank you. And welcome to our radio guests and our internet listeners. And we especially want to welcome our special guests of honor, Abby Brewer, Bailey Taze, and E. Ann Anderson. And we want to congratulate them on their, on their accomplishments and their graduation. Just to draw your attention just to a few announcements, this Wednesday night, uh, we'll be considering, as we're continuing on with the Seal of Psalms, we'll be considering to look at Psalm 57. So next Wednesday evening, this Wednesday evening, we'll be looking at Psalm 57. Next Sunday morning and evening, Pastor Steve Little, former Pastor Steve Little, will be with us uh, to open up the Word of God. On, so that's next Sunday morning. Mark that on your calendar, July 4th. There will be a VBS meeting on Sunday, July the 11th at 10 a.m. for those who would have signed up to help, who have been asked to help, or would like to help. So that's again a reminder about a VBS meeting Sunday, July 11th at 10 a.m. for those who have, been, who have signed up to help, been asked to help, or would like to help. Again, mark your calendars for the plan to protect August 29th and September the 12th. If you want to have any involvement in children's ministry, then this is a mandatory requirement. And we are still looking for a few Sunday school teachers and helpers for, for the fall, as well as some junior church and nursery workers. And so if you'd like to participate in those things, and you can come talk to us, We'll let you know what you need to have in order to do those various office and help us in that. Pray about it, would you please? We're at, see where God would help you have you to minister here at Faith Bible Baptist Fellowship. I believe that's all the announcements at this time, so I'd invite you to stand and read with me, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this morning. want to let our, our graduates know and our guests know also too that if you brought a card for Abby, Bailey, or Ian, then there are some certificates in the back there for, or some uh, baskets in the back of the uh, sanctuary where you can place some cards in it. So just if you brought some cards and don't know what to do with them, then there's some baskets in the back of the sanctuary for that as well. First Corinthians chapter 15. And we'll read the first 19 verses. First Corinthians 15 verses 1 to 19. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. I want to stop there for a second. You have a historical document relating the facts that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And it's not just a historical document that there were over 500 witnesses at once. It is something that happened over, over 2,000 years ago, or almost 2,000 years ago, but yet it was still documented. 
seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. It is a well-documented fact. Jesus Christ rose again from the grave. And you can trust him. You can trust him with your life for all eternity. Verse 7. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, or so we preach, or, and so ye believed. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up. If so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We'll pause there for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning, and Lord, we, we ask as we begin this service that you'd meet with us. We pray that by, by the Holy Spirit that you'd overpower us and anoint us and help us, Lord, to worship. Help us, Lord, to pay honor to whom honor is due, reverence to whom reverence is due, but Lord, we're here more, first and foremost to worship you. And we thank you, Lord, that we serve a risen Savior. We thank you, Lord, that we not only serve a risen Savior, but that we have a loving God who loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son into the world, not to condemn us, but that we through him might be saved. And Lord, the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is separation from you for all eternity, but you're not willing that any should perish. And so we thank you, Lord, today that Jesus Christ came to this earth and paid the price for our sin. He suffered and bled and died. But Lord, he also rose again from the grave the third day. And it's not a fable that we're asked to believe. It's a fact that has been well documented. It may have happened close to 2,000 years ago, but it's still a well documented fact. And so we thank you, Lord, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made known unto salvation. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Lord, we're thankful that you didn't only just tell us a story about how you, you, you allowed your son to suffer and to bleed and to die and to be buried and rise again from the grave the third day just for a story. But you told us what we need to do so that we might be saved and have forgiveness of sins. And so I thank you, Lord, for that verse of scripture that says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And our continued desire and prayers is, if there's anybody here in our audience this morning, or listening over the radio or the internet, and they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. May today be the day of salvation. May they come to you and call upon you now for salvation, the risen Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that you will hear, and all who come to you will in no wise cast out. But Lord, we, we not only need salvation, Lord, today, but we need strength, we need hope. Maybe there's someone listening today, and even though, Lord, that we could be celebrating, we know, Lord, that there are many who are mourning, who are hurting, they're suffering because of family illness, because of family tragedies, because of discouragement, lack of, loss of hope. And so, Father, we come before you, to Lord, today, as a, not only as a good shepherd, as a good savior, but as a great shepherd. Lead them beside still waters. Restore their soul. May they feel the comfort of your rod and your staff, I pray today. So, Lord, bless us, strengthen us, help us to worship you, and we give you thanks and praise for this new day. Help us, Lord, not to waste it, but worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Jerry, would you come and lead us in some more singing, please? I'm going to sing a few more songs here, beginning with number 41, Holy, Holy, Holy.
to sing the chorus as the deer. ask that you would stand for this next song if you can, number 526, Victory in Jesus.
singing, you may be seated. As I mentioned at the beginning of the service, uh, we want to truly welcome our guests, our, our guests of honor, Abby, Bailey, and Ian. All that we could have a big old party for you and give you all kinds of hugs and handshakes and have a big, put on a big feed for you. But alas, the government doesn't allow that right now. But well, there's a day coming. But we do want to take some time just to acknowledge you first off. And so we have a gift for you. And we hopefully, I'm sure that there'll be lots of money in the cards and things. And you can take your pastor out for lunch afterwards. And I'll let you do that with all the money you get. Now you'll watch it. There won't be any money in any of the cards. And I'll look like a fool. At least I'll look like a fool in private. Amen. Anyway, Abby Brewer, since you have Abby, A, you're the first one up. Look at the cute little thing there. Wasn't she sweet? Amen. Abby, would you come on up? We have a, a gift for you. We want to welcome you, congratulate you on your, your accomplishments, and good luck in the future. And Abby... Well, there she is building her truck. And there she is up on a fire ladder. <laughs> if that gives you any hint as to what you want to do, we're proud of you, Abby. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Abby. I give you a hug, but we're on live camera. <laughs> I, I have to start changing my phrases because I always used to call Abby, Abby girl. But as you can tell, she's turned into a beautiful young lady for which we're very proud. This next young lady, Bailey, starts with a B. Well, we want to congratulate Bailey. Bailey's going to be taking a year off um, and, and working, so if anybody has, needs a full-time worker, Bailey's looking for a job. And then she wants to go back to school and take up arts, and so we're proud of you, Bailey. It's been nice to know you and, and get to know you, and we hope that it continues. But Bailey, come. We have a present for you as well. Beautiful, beautiful young lady. I didn't really have any pet names for you, though, did I? <laughs> Especially not with your dad sitting right there. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And the next young fella is E-Man. I've always called him E-Man, but I suppose he is becoming into a fine young man and a cute little baby. Pretty little girl. <laughs> Ian, would you come? Ian's going to be going to community college in BCC in, in Moncton, is it, Ian? Yes. And taking farm agricultural repair services. So congratulations, Ian. Lord bless, buddy. And it's good to see you again. <laughs> Go back just a couple of pictures there, Colby. I just want to introduce you to Ian's girlfriend. I suppose you can't. There's one he, yeah, that, there she is right there. <laughs> Amen. What's her name, Ian? That one's Millie? That one's Millie? Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good, good, good. Well, take your Bibles, please. And hold on to them. You can open them up to the book of Proverbs, chapter 4. I got real creative in entitling my message today. I called it Graduation Message, June 27, 2021. But I designed this message with Abby. Bailey and Ian in mind. But before I get into the Word of God, I want to begin by reading the infamous words of Dr. Zeus and Yertle the Turtle. On the faraway island of Salmasand, Yertle the Turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm. There was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and they were all happy, quite happy indeed. They were, until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle, of all that I see. 
but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With this stone for a throne, I look down on my pond, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. The throne that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. If I could sit high, how much greater I'd be. What a king. I'd be ruler of all that I see. So Yertle the turtle king lifted his hand, and Yertle the turtle king gave a command. He ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and using these turtles, he built a new throne. He, ma he made each turtle stand on another's back, and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack. And then Yertle climbed up. He sat on the pile. What a wonderful view he could see most a mile. All mine, Yertle cried. Oh, the things that I now rule. I'm the king of a cow. Sorry, Ian. I'm the king of a mule. I'm the king of a house, and what's more beyond that? I'm the king of a blueberry bush and a cat. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh, marvelous me, for I'm ruler of all that I see. And all through the morning he sat up there high, saying over and over, A great king am I. Until long about noon, then he heard a faint sigh. What's that? snapped the king, and he looked down the stack. He saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac, just a part of his throne. And this plain little turtle looked up and he said, Beg your pardon, King Yertle. I have pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence, the king of turtles barked back. I'm king and your only turtle named Mac. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm the king of a cow and I'm the king of a mule. I'm the king of a house and a bush and a cat. But that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher, his royal voice thundered. So pile up more turtles. I want about 200. Turtles, more turtles, he bellowed and brayed. And the turtles way down the pond were afraid. They trembled, they shook, but they came, they obeyed. From all over the pond they came swimming by dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins. And all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another they climbed up the stack. Then Yertle the turtle was perched up so high he could see 40 miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray, shouted Yertle, I'm the king of the trees, I'm the king of the birds, and I'm the king of the bees. I'm the king of the butterflies, king of the air. Ah me, what a throne, what a wonderful chair. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh marvelous me, for I'm ruler of all that I see. Then again from below in the great heavy stack came a groan from that plain little turtle named Mac. Your majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below we are feeling great pain. I know up on top you're seeing great sights, but down here at the bottom we, we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it. Our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food. We're starving, groaned Mac. You hush up your mouth and howled the mighty King Yertle. You have no right to talk to the world's highest turtle. I, I rule the, from the clouds over land, over sea. There's nothing, no nothing that's higher than me. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening was starting to rise up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that, snorted Yertle. Say, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yertle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtles. I'll stack them to heaven. I need about 5,607. But as Yertle the turtle king lifted his head and started to order and give the command, the plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough, and he had. And that plain little lad got a bit mad. And that plain little Mac did a little thing. He burped. And his burp shook the throne of the king. And Yertle the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air, and the birds and the bees, the king of a house, and a cow and a mule. Well, that was the end of the turtle king's rule. For Yertle the king of all fell off his high throne and fell out plunk in the pond. And today that great Yertle, that marvelous he, is king of the mud. That's all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all the turtles are free as turtles and maybe all creatures should be. The moral of the story is, I don't have two clues. <laughs> but it's a cute little story, isn't it? And judging by what's going on in the news, we may not have a chance to hear tur your little turtle much longer. So get it while we can. But what I do want to talk to you about this is giving you, our graduates, some sound biblical advice for which you can build your lives on and give you a solid foundation. Your little turtle wanted to build his life on something that was feeble and frail, on the backs of others. And well, that can last for a while, but after a while, it's going to fall to pieces. So I want to give you some sound biblical advice. I've taken the word graduate and developed my advice from the letters that spell out the word graduate. So if you have your Bibles, take them and open them up to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. 
Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this. You all had your Bibles open, and I was too busy reading the story to open up my Bible. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23 says this. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The first piece of advice I want to give you to Bailey and to Abby and to Ian is simply this. Guard your heart. The word keep has the idea of guarding or protecting. The word heart has the idea of your inner you, who you are at the very core of your being. Protect yourself from those who seek to turn you away from God's design for you. Guard your emotions. Guard your affections. Guard your heart, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart. Now, the, the good news is, is we, we like to make statements, but then how do we, how do we guard our hearts? And thankfully, the, the Word of God tells us how we can exactly guard our hearts, protect who we are, and, because it's, it's a wicked, cruel world out there. How do we guard our hearts? How do we, we guard ourselves from being hurt from one another, being hurt from, from friends, being hurt from family, being hurt from the enemy? Well, look at verse 4. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 4 says this. He taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words. Keep my commandments and live. Go down to verse 20. My son, attend unto my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. One of the ways that we can guard our hearts is by reading the word of God. You say, I don't understand the relevance at all of it all. You will, but read it. Ready, read it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I believe it's first or second Peter chapter one that tells us this that everything that's written in the Word of God, the promises of God, are written for so that we might have all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has given us everything that we need to survive in this life, and it's found in His Word. And if we just read it, we can be blessed. So that's one way, one, one way we can guard our hearts. I want you to take your Bibles also and turn to the book of Philippians chapter 4. Philippians, Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, we have a, another way that we can guard our hearts. And I'm going to take the time to emphasize this because this is an important one. Life is cruel. My dad was dead at 55. Caleb was three years old. My dad had just bought him a first fishing pole. My kids have grown up, my, and shortly after that, my wife's dad got sick. So my, my dad died at 55. Caleb was three. Elena was one month old. Shortly after that, my wife's dad got sick, and he was unable to, to be a grandfather to our kids. Now, that's okay because, well, it's what was dealt to us. But I share that story because sometimes life is not fair. Things happen to us that we have no control over, and, and we want it would be nice to have family, and it's, it's nice to have friends all around us. But the simple fact of the matter is that life sometimes is pretty rotten. And if you don't guard your heart, if you don't guard your heart, you can become bitter, resentful, angry, and vengeful, and blame God. But we must guard our hearts. Guard our hearts. Guard our hearts with the word of God. Guard our hearts with this. Verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4 says this, Be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You guard your hearts by reading the word of God, and by praying, praying with thanksgiving, I realize you say, well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't have to make sense. But here's what I know. God says, guard our hearts. And he tells us very specifically, if you want to guard your hearts, then this is how you do it. With the word of God and with prayer. Now turn over to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14, we find a prayer for the Apostle, the Apostle Paul prayed for the Ephesian saints. He says in verse 14, Wherefore, of this, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Jesus Christ is God the Son. He's not just some fella that we talk about that lived 2,000 years ago. He's God. And I can think of nobody better to guard our hearts than to have Jesus Christ dwelling within. You have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And I want to encourage you that if you want to guard your hearts, it starts with the Word of God. It starts with prayer. But more importantly, it starts with Jesus Christ dwelling in your hearts and in your lives. Letting him be a part of your life. Asking him for cleansing and forgiveness. And, and to our graduates, to Ian, to Abby, and to Bailey, if you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, if you've never invited him into your life, if you want to guard your hearts so that you can stand strong in the trials of life, then that is step one, inviting Jesus to become part of your life. Guard your hearts with the Word of God, with prayer, with the God of all the universe who can stand strong and protect you and strengthen you and help you to deal with all, anything that may come across you in your life. For out of it, guard your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. Well, that's just the first letter, G. Guard your heart. Turn with me, please, to the book of Ecclesiastes. The book of Ecclesiastes. I'm sure if you, you know the scriptures at all, you know what I'm going to. But just in case there's somebody here who doesn't know what I'm talking about, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. My advice to the grads is guard your heart. My advice to our graduates is exactly what Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 1 says this. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. I know you think you have the world by the tail and you, and you do. But I want to encourage you that if you want to have some good sound advice and, and build your life on something solid that will not crumble and fall and, and shake and wobble when the storms of life, remember now thy creator. Never forget about God. He loves you. I, I was saying to someone yesterday, God has paid a high price for you. He sent his son to suffer and to bleed and to die on the cross of Calvary for you. He, he, he saw so much value in your lives that he was willing to send his son to suffer and to bleed and to die on the cross of Calvary. Don't forget about him. He, he's there. He, he's the good shepherd. He, he's the God of all the universe who wants to help you, to strengthen you, to equip you to, so that you can face the trials of life. Remember now your creator. Why don't you turn to Colossians chapter 1. Please, Colossians chapter 1. As we think about remembering now thy creator... Colossians chapter 1, talking about Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. That little word consist, at the end there's a word I want you to focus on. It means hold it all together. Sometimes the storms and trials and troubles of life make you feel like you're just going to fall to pieces. You don't know how you're going to last. You wonder how you're going to hold it all together. You hold it all together by remembering God because he's the one who will help you hold it together so that you don't fall to pieces. Remember now thy creator. But sometimes in life the storms get rough and we lose him in the midst of the storm clouds. And I want to just give you three little things real quickly to help you remember your creator. The Bible says in Psalm 121, I will lift up my eyes into the hills, for once cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Everywhere we look around us, we see the beautiful rolling hills of Sussex and Kings County. Everywhere we look, we're reminded of the presence of God. More than that, then not only do we have the hills to help us to remember God, but the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, says this, or 40 verse, um, give you the right verse here, verse 26 it says this, lift up your eyes and see the hosts in heaven. The stars is what it's referring to. God has given us the stars. He says, I, I've, I've got them all named. I, I put them all up there and I've got them all named. I, I know what I'm doing. The stars of the heaven remind us of God. 
And then Matthew chapter 6, in the chapter that talks about anxiety and, and worry and fear, says this, consider the lilies of the field, consider the birds of the air, I look after them, and I will look after you. So when you're feeling discouraged and you, you forget about God, look to the hills, look to the stars, see the birds and the flowers. They're reminders of God's physical presence, that he loves us. He's here for us. Life is going to get busy. Your whole world is going to change, and you have no idea how much is going to change now. You really don't. And then sometimes you feel like you're going to be lost. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Guard your heart. Remember now thy creator. 2 Timothy chapter 2. As we move on to the letter A. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, we read this. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I want to encourage you to avoid youthful lusts. Do you see that word flee? That means it's not a game. Run away as fast as you can and as soon as possible. I want you to turn back with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 5. Proverbs chapter 5, as we just sort of just take this thought just a little bit more. There are certain things in life that you're going to say, well, what's so wrong with this? I want what I want. Why can't I have what I, what I want? Sometimes when we get what we want, we enjoy it for a season. But then after we finally get what we want, we find out there's a high price to pay. One of the things I've told my children over the last few years is this. And Bailey and Abby and Ian, I want you to remember this. When you were young, mommy and daddy could protect you from a lot of the consequences of your actions. They had a certain realm of protection over you, and, and they could protect you from certain kinds of consequences. But understand this. As you grow older now, you make your own choices. With choices comes consequences. And we can't protect you anymore. So avoid youthful lusts. Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1 says this. My son, or my, my daughter, Abby, Bailey, Ian, attend unto my wisdom. Bow thine, thine ear to my understanding, that thou mayest regard discretion and keep, and that thy lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman, the lips of a strange man drop as in honeycomb, and her mouth, his mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of hell. What he's trying to emphasize is this. There are greater consequences sometimes to your actions than you realize. And there's some consequences that have lasting, lifelong effects. Verse 6, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear, hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her home, her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others, and thy years unto the cruel. Lest strangers be filled with thy wealth, and thy labors in the house of a stranger. And thou mourn at the last, when thy flesh and thy body are consumed. And say, how have I hated instruction, and my heart despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. Why is it that we should regard the word of God and, and, and uh, guard our hearts with the word of God? Because the word of God is given, meant to protect us from making bad decisions. And sometimes the consequences of our decisions have lasting effects that we cannot avoid. Older people, can I get an amen to that? The consequences of our choices. Avoid youthful loss. Be careful of, of biting the worm that's dangled in front of you, the carrot. My wife and I have been trying to buy a car for the last month and a half, and we finally bought a car on Friday. But I'm going to tell you, it's been an up, down, and hip people. And they, they, we, we thought we had a deal on a vehicle, and then they showed us another vehicle, and then they sold the vehicle. They dangled the carrot in front of our face, and we almost bit it. But it got sold before we had a chance to bite it. But that's what the devil likes to do. Dangle little carrots in front of your face to get you to nibble. But I'm going to tell you, on the other end of that hook, on the, on the other end of that carrot is a hook. And it's 
Roots go down to hell, the very pit of hell. And what that's saying is this, the consequences are very drastic. And sometimes they have life-lasting consequences from which we never recover. So avoid youthful loss. Guard your heart. Remember now thy creator. Avoid youthful loss. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15. I suppose there are many passages of Scripture that we could turn to, and, and we could. But I just wanted to just share one verse of Scripture. John chapter 15. He talks about in John chapter 15, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Verse 4 says, Abide in me and I in you as a branch cannot bear fruit of itself. I am the vine. Verse 5, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Verse 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. So God wants us to have a fruitful life, and the only way we can have a fruitful life is if we abide in Jesus Christ and we remain close to him, and not only will he guard our hearts, but look at verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. One of the reasons why God gives us some no's and some negative things and some positive things is this, and why he tells us about the need to abide in him is because he wants us to discover joy. God wants us to have a, a, a meaningful life. He wants us to have a fruitful life. He wants us to have a full life, not a, a hateful life, not a, a, a disparaging life. He wants us to have joy. Discover the joy of the Lord. Joy is defined by Marion Webster as a state of happiness or felicity. Bliss, a source or cause of delight. Unger's Bible Dictionary defines joy as a delight of the mind arising from the consideration of a present or assured possession of a future good. It comes by abiding in Jesus and is a fruit of the Spirit. God wants to have joy. He wants you to experience life to its fullest. He wants you to have a happy life. He wants you to have a meaningful life. He wants you to have a blessed life, a prosperous life. But if we ignore him, that peace, that happiness, that joy, you'll never experience. So discover the joy that God has. God wants you to enjoy his life. God wants you to enjoy his presence. Discover the joy of the Lord for yourselves. Letter U. Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, there are many things that we can find in here. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 says this, Be therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us and hath given us, given himself for us, an offering and a sweet sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking or jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know that no whoremonger nor unclean person or covetous nor who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things com- cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The letter U has this, understanding what the will of God is for you. There are lists of some negative things in there, and none of those things are part of the will of God. But I want you to know this, that God has a plan for your life. And if you remember him and guard your hearts with his word and, and avoid youthful loss and discover his joy, you'll begin to experience the will of God, and you'll learn what the will of God is for your life. I beseech you, Romans 12, 1 says this, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove 
What is that good? What is that acceptable and perfect will of God? Ian, Abby, and Bailey, God has a plan for your life. God has a good plan for your life. And a plan that involves happiness. A plan that enjoys fruitfulness. A plan that involves blessing. But if you forget him, you'll wander aimlessly. God has a wonderful plan for your life. And he wants us to understand. He wants us to understand what his will is for our lives. We can know. And so therefore, if he wants us to know, that means he's got something good in store for our lives. It may not make a whole lot of sense at the time, but God wants us to know. And God has a purpose for your life. I know sometimes you get lost in the world. Sometimes you wonder, well, does anybody really care? Well, you know, because when I, when I left high school, I was going to be a physiotherapist. I was going to be a chiropractor. I was going to do anything that made some money. But I, boy, did I get a rude awakening. And for a while there, because my plans weren't happening, I got lost. And then God said, Tim, I've got something better for you to do. Preach the word. Pastor the flock the will of God for my life. I don't know what the will of God is for your life, but here's what I know this. If you don't seek him, if you don't ask him and find him, you'll never know it. And I know this because I've talked to too many people. Those who don't follow the will of God for their lives are unhappy, miserable, and feel like life is not worth living. Understand what the will of God is, that God has a plan for your life. 1 John chapter 1. The epistle of 1 John. The epistle of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. The apostle John, who was a witness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, says in verse 3, That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. What I want you to understand from this passage of scripture in in 1 John chapter 1 verses 3 to 10 is this. The need to admit that you have sinned. When you sin. See the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the only thing that stops us from experiencing forgiveness and cleansing is because we don't want to admit that we have done wrong. It goes back to our, our our. Founding fathers and our founding mother, Adam and Eve. When they had sinned in the Garden of Eden, what did they do? They blamed the other person. They blamed the serpent. They blamed this. They blamed the devil. They blamed their spouse, but they would not take responsibility for their own actions. I want you to know this, young people, listen to me. At a young age, when you do wrong, admit it. Admit it. One of the greatest barriers to to marital relationships, one of the greatest barriers to a human relationship is this, when people won't admit when they have done wrong. And so therefore, because they won't admit when they've done wrong, they choose to justify themselves and it's, it's, it's not my fault. Sometimes it is. The beautiful thing is this, when we are willing to admit that we have done wrong, when we're willing to admit that we have sinned, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness never forget my friends the bible says all have sinned we all sin we all make mistakes and there's forgiveness but there's only forgiveness for those who are willing to admit it and come to jesus christ and ask him for cleansing and forgiveness never be afraid no matter how old you get older person have you forgotten you make mistakes too that you sin too is there some sin that's uh, standing between you and another's relationship admit it first come to god for forgiveness then go and ask others for forgiveness as well. Admit when you have done wrong. It will require some humility. But God lifts up the humble. Guard your heart. Remember now thy creator. Avoid youthful lust. Discover the joy of the Lord. Understand that God has a plan for your life. Admit when you have sinned. Turn back with me, please, to Proverbs chapter 3. 
Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Verse 5 says this, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Life isn't going to make sense sometimes. God may be directing you in paths and ways that you, you just humanly, human reasoning says it's not going to happen. I want you to remember to trust the Lord no matter what. No matter what you go through, trust the Lord. That's why reading his word is so important because in there if we're given advice that human, human reason says it's not the way to do it, but God says this is the way to do it. For instance, when it says, how do you deal with enemies? Number one, how do you deal with your enemies? You don't talk bad about them. You eulogize them. Bless them which persecute you, hurt you. Bless and curse not. You do good to them. You pray for them. You don't badmouth them. Now you say, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. How's that supposed to change my enemies? Well, first you start with you, and then you leave it with God. But trust the Lord. His ways make sense. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy paths. And then lastly, turn back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4 is a book written by a man to his spiritual son, a young prodigy who was just trying to make his way in life. And he says, Paul says to the Timothy, he says, Timothy, refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Exercise yourself unto godliness. You say, well, how do you do that? Read God's word. Pray. Avoid youthful lust. Discover the joy. Understand God's plan. Admit when you have sinned. Exercise yourself unto godliness. Seek God's will for your life. It's not going to be easy. It means if you're going to read the Bible, that means you're going to have to take some time out of your day to, to devote to reading the Bible, to time to praying. But it's going to take some exercise. And exercise thyself unto godliness. Abby, Bailey, Ian, this is my advice to you. Guard your heart. Remember God in your youth. Avoid youthful lust. Discover the joy of the Lord for yourself. Understand that God has a plan for your life and admit when you have sinned. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts. And exercise yourself unto godliness. God wants us to have a full and meaningful life. But if we ignore him, the writer of Ecclesiastes says, we will have a, a, voided, uh, we will have a void and a life will be meaningless. And you'll wonder, what's the point of it all? And you'll think, well, what have I been spending my years doing? But if you remember God, if you guard your heart, Remember your creator. Avoid youthful lust and discover the joy that God has for you. Understand that God has a plan and purpose for your life. Admit when you have sinned, trust in the Lord and exercise yourself unto godliness. You will find a life filled with meaning. You'll find a life of blessing, of purpose. You'll find a life that has God in it. And life makes sense with that. My dear friends, what about you? Where does God fit into your life? Not sure that he does? Would you like him to? Are you willing to admit that you are a sinner who deserves hell? Are you willing to believe that Jesus Christ suffered and bled and died for you, but rose again from the grave the th three days later? Are you willing right now to call upon him to forgive you, cleanse you, and save you? Then I invite you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you a sinner condemned unclean. I do deserve wrath, and I deserve hell. But I believe you love me so much that you sent Jesus Christ to suffer, to bleed, and to die on the cross of Calvary. And he did that for me. But he didn't just die. He rose again from the grave the third day for my justification so that I might have eternal life. 
so that right now, as best I know how, I'm calling upon you. I want you to be the guardian of my heart and my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. And this I pray. Lord, maybe there's somebody listening to this program today at the service and they're here and they've, they've trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Would you, Lord, give them the assurance that they need? But Lord, more importantly, maybe there's somebody here, Lord, and maybe years ago they trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they've gotten far away from you. They wanted so far away from home. Lord, would you bring them home today? And thank you, Lord, that if we confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Help the Lord today to confess their sin. They come to you for cleansing, I pray. So, Lord, dismiss us now with thy blessing. And, Lord, I pray your special blessing today upon Abby, upon Bailey, and upon Ian. May they take these principles, these pieces of advice. And, Lord, probably not going to remember all of them. They might remember a few of them. Lord, just give them one to remember, I pray, that would strengthen them and help them today. Bless them, we ask. Guide them and direct them. And Lord, we want to thank you for allowing them to be part of our lives. We commit them into your hands now, Lord, and we ask for your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to sing in closing number 219, Jesus Paid It All. And I'd ask that you would uh, stand as we sing uh, just the first and last verses of that. 219, Jesus Paid It All. Congratulate our grads. Reminder about the gifts and the cards uh, in the back of the sanctuary for you. Also, a reminder about the service tonight at 6 p.m. We're going to be looking at Ezekiel chapter 22 to 24. God's city is doomed. The city of Jerusalem is doomed. And what that has to say to us tonight. So, we're also going to be on the radio. So, if you get a chance, you can't come, then you can listen to us live on the radio tonight. Father, dismiss us now with thy blessing. Again, Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your promises. And we thank you for your power. May we experience them all today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming and God bless.